Hi, everybody. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you for inviting me to this special weekend. I feel really honored to be with you. And as I speak with more and more of you individually, my husband and I are both feeling how much we belong with you and what kindred spirits we are with um, theosophists and those of you who aren't official theosophists but are some kind of mystical or metaphysical seekers. So I'm very at home here. I also want to thank Nancy. Is Nancy, Nancy, I want to thank Nancy because she shepherded me here step by step with the patience of a saint. And I'm very grateful for that. So, um, Barbara gave you a little bit about my background. I just want to add that um, I retired this month as a clinician. And um, did I get one of those? Yeah. yeah. And um, it's a very big passage. Some of you may know that. And I think for me, it's both a, a passage, a transition toward more full-time writing, but also toward more contemplative practice. And um, I think, you know, for late life, many of us have that orientation. If not now, when, right? Um, I'm also here as a shadow worker on myself over many decades. And that means that I hold the light to be divine the essence of spirit within us, and I hold the shadow to be radiant, as this beautiful word that you guys used in the title for the weekend. The shadow is, a, is, a radi is radiant because it's a hidden source of intelligence within us, a hidden source of information, of self-knowledge, of direction within us. It's not just all the bad stuff. It's the bad stuff to the ego right? But it's, it's radiant and divine, just as the light is. But I also wanted to clarify that I'm not here as a philosopher or as a metaphysician. Um, I'm not here to present ontology about good and evil, as you might explore with religious teachers. I'm going to stay within the realm of the individual human psyche in the subjective reality in which we all live and struggle because that's kind of my professional expertise and that's where I'm not speculating as much as speaking from experience. And so I want to explore with you the ways in which the dark side of the human psyche appears in us every day, sometimes many times a day, not in sociopaths, again, who live, kind of live out the dark side, are possessed by it, but us, everyday, ordinary human beings, seekers of the light, who also experience the darkness within us, and also can find the gold in the dark side of ourselves. So how many of you have any preliminary understanding of the shadow? Either you've read some of my books or you've read Jung or you... Okay, great, great. Okay, wonderful. And how many of you have a meditation practice? Ah, fantastic. Okay. I'm with my community. So um, <clears throat> I want to start with some questions for you to kind of carry away with you as objects of contemplation. And so you can remember them or you can make a note of them, whatever you prefer. I'm going to ask you some free, a free association question, OK? Your, what is your first association to shadow? OK. OK. Okay, the sun casting a shadow. What did you say? Uh huh. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. Reflection. Reflection. Okay. Negative thinking. Negative thinking. A dark side. Okay. Can you admit to yourself that you have one? Yeah. <laughs> Not a lot of denial in this crowd. <laughs> and what do you feel or believe would happen if someone saw it? Yes, naked. The spouse says, screaming. <laughs> screaming. Okay. Okay. So there's some discomfort when our shadow is exposed, isn't there? So let me begin with a story. Um, <clears throat> So in Oscar Wilde's only novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, some of you may know the story, the central character, Dorian, is a vain, beautiful young man in 19th century England. And he sees a painting of himself that's really handsome and without a flaw. And he decides that he wants to remain that way, perfect and youthful forever. So he makes a pact with the devil. All signs of his degeneration, all evidence of his greed and cruelty would from then on appear on the painting rather than on his own face. And the painting gets hidden away in a closet, never to be seen by anyone. But from time to time, the young man's curiosity gnaws at him and he cautiously pulls the picture out of the darkness and takes a quick glance, only to see the beautiful face growing more and more hideous. <laughs> so, how is each of us like Dorian Gray? We seek to present a beautiful and innocent face to the world, a kind, courteous demeanor, a youthful, intelligent image. And so unknowingly, but inevitably, we push away those qualities that don't fit the image and that don't enhance our self-esteem and instead bring us shame. Somebody mentioned shame and make us feel small. <clears throat> we shove into the dark cavern of the unconscious those feelings that make us uneasy. Hatred, rage, jealousy, greed, lust, competition, shame. And those behaviors that are deemed wrong by the culture. Addiction, laziness, aggression, dependency. Thereby creating shadow content. And like Dorian's painting, these qualities take on a life of their own, forming an invisible twin that lives just behind our life or just beside it, but as dis distinct as the one from the one that we know as ourselves as a stranger. This stranger, Carl Jung called the shadow. And it is us, but it's not us. Hidden from our awareness, the shadow is not part of our conscious self-image, so it seems to appear or erupt very abruptly, very suddenly, out of nowhere, like an unwanted visitor, in a range of behaviors that shock us and tear holes in our masks. So a polite woman finds herself lying to a friend or a religious man begins to drink more and more each night. Or a kind woman can't stop herself from criticizing her husband. Or a married man begins to cheat and feel an addictive thrill. A depressed woman starts to binge and can't stop herself. A father who sees himself as a good parent screams uncontrollably at his child. 
So like Dorian's closet, within each of us, the dim cavern of the unconscious holds our forbidden feelings and secret wishes, and destructive impulses, and also our creative urges. Over time, these forces take on a life of their own. And this has been a recurring theme in literature and legend for centuries now. Mephistopheles, Mr. Hyde, Darth Vader, the Terminator, Satan, the Dark Angel, in Buddhism, Mara, in Sufism, the Nafs, in Judaism, the Evil Impulse. You can probably think of lots more. When the shadow acts out in the public domain, which happens a lot lately, we witness our, lead, right? we witness our leaders fall from grace into scandals of corruption, revealing their greed and cheating and lying and seduction and lust for power. And when the shadow acts out in the religious or spiritual arena, we witness our clergy and our spiritual teachers fall from grace into scandals of abuse, such as the Catholic priest childhood sexual abuse epidemic, or the series of sexual scandals among Eastern teachers in the 90s. And tomorrow, my talk is going to focus on that. So closer to home, we personally might feel overcome with feelings that are very unfamiliar to us and behaviors that are very unfamiliar to us. And these appearances of the shadow introduce us to what I call the other a powerful force in us that, we've, that we can't tame or control. So we might find ourselves saying something like, I'm furious and I'll punish you. I can't stop thinking about her no matter how I distract myself. I know I'm gaining weight, but I just want carbs. No, I didn't tell him what I did. I'm too ashamed. I'm hopeless, just can't see a way forward. Seeing it, meeting the shadow, is a first step. Learning to live with it, which I call romancing the shadow, is a lifelong masterwork. It means reading the messages encoded in the events of our life in such a way that we gain consciousness, self-knowledge, substance, soul. We gain a connection to our own depths beyond the personality an inner world that's rich and soulful. <clears throat> so, our f now I don't know about this crowd, but for most people, our first typical response is denial. Right? I wouldn't do that. I didn't mean that. I didn't say that. I'll get sober next week. I don't need help. Things will change. And as we disown it, we hardly notice that the dark fantasy or cruel comment or intense feeling because it's banished so quickly back into the darkness. And we don't even notice that we fail to notice. So denial is entrenched because the shadow doesn't want to come out of hiding. Its nature is to hide to remain outside of conscious awareness. And that's what, when I refer to the darkness, that's what I'm meaning in this talk. Outside of conscious awareness, rather than in the light of consciousness. So it acts out indirectly, concealed in a depression, or it, lacks, it, le it leaks out compulsively in an addiction. And so we need to learn shadow work in order to catch a glimpse of it and coax it out into awareness. And then it will recede again behind the curtain. And again, with patience, we can invite it out. And this process, which some of you may have experienced, of bringing sh the shadow to consciousness and forgetting and recognizing it again, and forgetting and recognizing it again, is the nature of shadow work. And eventually, we learn to create an ongoing relationship with it, and we, it reduces its power to sabotage us. 
The more unconscious it is, the more power it has over us. So why does this happen? Why are we made like this? Where does a shadow come from? So each of us has a psychological heritage that's no less real than our genetic one. It includes a legacy of intergenerational issues that are transmitted to us through grandparents and parents' moods, values, behavior patterns, treatment of us, even little gestures, eye movements, because those small things can be shaming, right? Can, be, can close us down. It's transmitted to us in their unconscious, unfulfilled dreams and desires. And so we absorb it in the psychic soup of our family environment. We absorb it unconsciously, forming our own budding identities and behavior patterns, temperaments, and coping strategies. And we begin to sense at a young age what's required to feel safe and loved and accepted. We begin to adapt ourselves to form our ego or our conscious personality in order to survive. But the development of the ego requires that we don't express the bad stuff, the forbidden traits and actions that risk abandonment or punishment or shame. And so they get repressed, banished into the shadow, and they create that bad twin who carries the rejected, denied, unacceptable qualities. And in this way, our egos and our shadows develop in tandem, together, right alongside each other. And the conscious personality becomes a false self. You might have heard that term. Because it's like a mask that we present to the world. And the shadow lives beneath the threshold of, of awareness and it's hidden, and it's gathering strength. So when we're a little older, we attend school, and, or we attend church, and our teachers and clergy impress on us the difference between right and wrong, right? And we want to become a good girl, or a good boy. And we internalize those lessons, and we regulate our behavior, or we rebel against it as we can see on every playground as we watch kids. <clears throat> in a little book on the human shadow, the great poet Robert Bly tells a story about the formation of the shadow. So Robert tells this story. When we were one or two years old, we had a 360 degree personality with energy radiating out of our bodies and souls and forming a living globe of energy around us. And one day we noticed that our parents didn't like certain parts of the ball. And they said, can't you be still? It isn't nice to hit your brother. So to keep our parents' love, we pushed those parts they didn't like into an invisible bag that we carry behind us. And by the time we entered school, the bag was growing and the radiance was shrinking. And then our teacher said, good children don't get mad. Good children sit at their desks. So our anger went into the bag and our need to move around went into the bag. And by the time we were 12, we knew how to be nice kids. And then in high school, we did more bag stuffing in an effort to fit in. And we may have stuffed our athletic abilities to hang out with a smart crowd, or our intellectual interests to hang out with the athletes. We may have stuffed our fashion inclinations, or our creative gifts, or our sexuality for the approval of our peers. And by the time we went to college, we had a long, heavy bag behind us. So Bly concludes that we spend our lives until we're 20, stuffing part of ourselves into the bag, and we spend the rest of our lives trying to get it out again. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And as we begin to open the bag and discover what's hidden there, we may find all kinds of forbidden, uncomfortable things, but we will also find our lost gifts and talents and dreams and fantasies that were sacrificed to form a persona so that we could fit into society. <clears throat> so, as we've said, the shadow is formed through repression, stuffing bad feelings and behaviors away into the darkness. And hidden in the dark, they build charge, and then they erupt later. And we meet the shadow in these small eruptions every day, when we feel humiliated by an unacceptable part of ourselves, the critic, the addict, the thief, the miser, the couch potato, the liar. Or, and then we meet an interior saboteur, a shadow quality. And when we feel possessed by a mood or behavior that we can't control, like a depression or an addiction, we meet a bigger shadow character. We feel as if our conscious intentions are crossed by some unknown, unconscious opponents. And often, the material that was repressed also emerges as a projection onto someone else. So you've probably heard that word projection. We unconsciously attribute to someone else the quality that we can't stand in ourselves. Right? I hear some giggling. When we walk into a party and we feel an immediate dislike of a stranger. He's so stupid. She's so fat. He's so arrogant. She's so seductive. And we don't know these people, right? We meet a projected shadow quality, something, there's a message there, something about ourselves. So the aim of meeting the shadow is to develop an ongoing relationship with this part and expand our sense of self by balancing the narrow one-sidedness of the ego with the richness of the unconscious depths in us. And when we make an aspect of the unconscious conscious, we fulfill the mandate to know thyself. So, this is a lot of words, but we're gonna go over them. So, you might recognize some way in which you meet your shadow in this list. Exaggerated feelings about yourselves that you reject right? I'm so X, Y, Z. I'm so whatever it is. I'm so judgmental. I'm so this. I'm so that. Okay? Or same kind of intense reaction, but this time onto someone else, right? He's so this. She's so that. And if you can examine that, you might see that what you're attributing to the other person is a rejected or a denied part of yourself. Okay? Stereotypes, we all know about this. Racism, sexism, ageism, homophobia. These are collective projections of the shadow. These are group ways of attributing negative traits to other groups. That, that has a specific purpose, but this is a shadow projection. Addictions. Some part of us that is unknown, that is buried, we don't know why it's having a craving, urges us to a substance or a food or a relationship that we know is self-destructive and that's Take, that, that causes us to lose control, to sabotage ourselves. <clears throat> Slips of the tongue. I had a client um, who's, um, when he was getting married, his father gave him handcuff, uh, uh, cufflinks, 
cufflinks. <laughs> and that's what he said to me. He said, he, I can't believe he gave me handcuffs. And it was cufflinks. So there are all kinds of in, in humor and slips of the tongue. If you look at them, you can see shadow qualities. That's right, humor, off-color jokes, especially when we laugh at someone else's expense. When we get negative feedback from someone we love and trust, right? Um, this is the third time you arrived late this week. But we can get other feedback, you know, uh, you've been critical a lot lately, or um, whatever it is, it can be given with love, it can be given by your best friend, but it can give you the potential for a glimpse into some um, hidden quality there that you're acting out unknowingly. In midlife, the shadow often rears its head when people want to burn their bridges and start over, when they want to reject the first half of their lives, crash their marriage, crash their career, you know, um, feel regret. And in our dreams at night, I'm sure many of you have tuned into your dreams and found characters who are engaged in behaviors that you consciously would never engage in, right? But they're your dreams, so that part of you is acting out some kind of destructive or self-destructive behavior in your dream. <clears throat> so many people you know, awaken in adulthood to a growing desire for self-awareness. And all of us, certainly in this room, maybe for many years have felt that. And we want more authenticity and more intimacy with people as well. And this is a natural developmental process, but it, unlike biological transitions, like going into adolescence, this transition needs to be done with intention and I think most of you know this, it needs to involve, first of all, a shift in our awareness from the exterior to the interior world. We need to learn how to examine ourselves and how to self-reflect. And sometimes this happens when we meet a shadow, when we face a loss or suffer a disillusionment, when we see a painful pattern in relationship that we want to change, or sometimes when we experience an altered state of consciousness or have a mystical peak experience, we recognize that it's time to turn within more. And <clears throat> often this leads people into therapy. Sometimes it leads people into meditation or other kinds of contemplative practices. But when I see, when I, used to see people in therapy, um, I would explain that our psyches are not so solid, unified Teflon walls. There is no single ego that's kind of like a monotheistic god. Our psyches are dynamic and they're fluid and they're populated by many inner characters. And so and these characters come and go quickly from moment to moment. And if you're aware of your thinking process, especially through meditation, you know that about yourself. So during these shifts, we may feel like we're possessed for a moment by a single character. And it kind of takes over, it grips us, while a lot of the other parts of us remain off stage. And when one part acts out, it may not feel like me at all, right? So when was the last time that happened to you? Maybe you got angry and you lost control and you felt kind of possessed by that feeling for a moment. I don't mean possessed in an occult way, but that that takes over your psyche in that moment. Or you lost control of your eating and you felt taken over in that moment, or your or sadness took control for a moment. 
So what I call these parts is shadow characters. And they arise from the shadow, from the unconscious, with a whole history. Each one of them has a whole her personal history and a wound to bear and a gift to give. So I'm going to explore this with you a little bit. So when these powerful thoughts and feelings take us over, it's like we're um, in a stormy sea, right? And we have nothing to hold on to. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Because I see some heads nodding. OK. So when we're in that moment, where we're kind of blown about by the winds of our thoughts and feelings. We need a mast to hold on to, to center ourselves. And that's one of the purposes of meditation. With meditation, you learn to get a little space, right, from your thoughts and feelings. With a lot of meditation, you learn to recognize that that's not who you are. You are not those thoughts and feelings. But even in the beginning, as you begin to learn, you begin to get quiet. And you notice how much your thoughts come and go. They just come and go. They come and go, no matter what you do. And the purpose of meditation, one of the purposes, is to begin to hear the voices, hear the thoughts, and feel the feelings without cracking up on the rocks, without getting swept away in the storm, right? And so you develop the capacity for self-observation or witnessing through some kind of contemplative practice. And when you can witness your thoughts and feelings with some detachment, you can begin to experience them without allowing them to take over. Have any of you had that experience? A few of you have. OK. So before you learn this, most people have not experienced this. So before you learn that, your psyche is just splashed with the emotions of the moment, right? And your identity is lost in them. So you might say, I'm depressed, rather than I feel sad, right? Or I am no good rather than, I'm no good at this task. So you're identifying with the experience in the moment, and you get lost in it. But after you learn to witness these, you can begin to watch them, and your identification doesn't fall into them. So you might say, I feel sad with this loss, but I know it will pass. You hear the difference? I'm not skilled at this task, but it doesn't detract from my overall value. Which is very different from, I'm no good, right? So why am I talking about this? <clears throat> I want to point out that shadow work is spiritual work that we can't really face the darkness and the forces of the unconscious without being connected to the light, without being connected to a spiritual practice that links us to spirit or the divine or whatever we call it, that that's really essential for doing shadow work. And from my point of view, there are many, many spiritual practices, and I know you guys are really inclusive and eclectic. So I'm not here to um, advocate for one practice. So whatever it is, whether you do belly breathing or zazen or vipassana or centering prayer or TM, I don't care. I, is, but, but to do shadow work, you need a way to connect to the light right, to come back to your center in order to face the darkness. And that's why this is essentially, from my point of view, spiritual work. And eventually, as we do this, we can offer our shadow characters a place 
in our psyches where their voices can be heard and their deeper needs honored because every one of these shadow issues that I've brought up as examples has a deeper need hidden inside of it. That that's its secret and that's its gift. That's the gold in the dark side. And eventually we can begin to uncover that with this work. Okay, so I'm gonna give you um, an example. <coughs> because we're kind of abstract. I don't want to just stay abstract. So um, for many people in the West, the rise of science and technology meant a rejection of religious life. And as we know from theosophy and from perennial philosophy, our souls long for some connection to spirit, something greater than the ego. I call this the holy longing. And so we're going to focus on that in the next talk tomorrow. But today, I want to say that if we don't have a spiritual context in which to channel our yearning um, or a meditation practice to provide a direct experience of transcendence, then our longing finds other objects of desire more concrete, mundane realms of life will be forced to carry it. And this is the root of addiction. So before Bill W, before Bill w I forget, was it Wilson, Bill Wilson, Bill oh, W? Yeah, yeah. Before he launched AA, he corresponded with Carl Jung. And Jung told him that the craving for alcohol or spirits was equivalent on a lower level to the spiritual thirst for union with the divine. Isn't that incredible? And this insight helped me to realize that any addiction masks our holy longing, our longing for spirit. So let's apply what we've done so far to the inner addict shadow character, okay? And obviously, you may not use drugs or alcohol, but you may find some other way in, the, in which this is relevant to you. So, you meet the shadow by these three cues, okay? The first cue is mechanical, repetitive thoughts. This shadow character always says the same thing inside your head. I can't stop myself, I can't live without it, I need to get high, I can start recovery, I can go on a diet, I can do blah, blah, blah tomorrow. It always says the same thing. It has no variation <laughs> in, its, in the inner dialogue. And if you start to listen to it, you'll see it always says the same thing. Okay, it always has the same feelings that go along with that inner dialogue. Same feelings might be helplessness, um, anxiety, emptiness. And it always has the same bodily sensations that go with it as well. Same tightening of the abdomen or tightening of the shoulders or feeling of emptiness in your gut. So when you begin to recognize these signals, thoughts, feelings, and sensations, then you, do your, then you recognize that a shadow character is around. And you do your centering practice. And you begin to witness your internal experience and begin to make notes of it. What are the thoughts, feelings, and sensations of this shadow character? And then you can give it an image. You can ask, who's there? Right? Who is this shadow character? And sometimes right away, if you're visual, some people are more visual than others, you'll see a picture. And then you give it a name. Could be the addict, the drinker. One of my clients uses the foodie. 
the smoker, um, the doer, the, you know, the overdoer. And you recognize that this shadow character is not who you are. It's not your spiritual identity, right? It's not your divine essence. It's a part of you that's coming up in the moment with a need, but it's not who you are. And in that way, you break your identification with it. If you want to, you can trace the roots of this character in your history and see where it came from. You know, who treated you in a certain way and who said certain things and therefore you have this shadow character. But when you recognize this, you'll see that your reaction in the present moment is a reaction from the past. It's like time traveling. When you're in a shadow character, you're time traveling. You're not here now. And then you recognize what are the consequences What are the consequences of listening to this shadow character as you usually do? Of eating that ice cream, of having that third drink, whatever it is. And knowing this, you can make a different choice. If you, do, if you can't make a different choice, you can observe your resistance. What stops you? We were speaking about resistance. What stops you from changing this behavior pattern? Okay, I'm going to give you one more. So, another common example. Are any of you a therapist in the room? Yeah, okay. So, you know about inner the inner child work. <clears throat> so, this very young part of us is a key shadow character. And it, it lives in us, you know, Forever, no matter how old we get, we have an inner infant and we have an inner toddler and we have an inner teenager that remain those ages, right? They don't grow up with us. There are these parts of us that kind of have autonomous lives in us. And they have vast influence over the quality of our lives, over how we feel about ourselves, whether we're able to express feelings, whether we feel safe or anxious whether we feel seen or invisible. So, let's meet this shadow character. So, this inner child always has the same mechanical, identical thought patterns, inner dialogue, right? Doesn't vary. So, she may say, I, I, I'm alone, no one loves me, he'll leave me too, I better not cry or she'll get angry. Maybe some of you can recognize right now what your inner child says to you when these needs come up and you feel young and you feel scared or you feel defenseless or you feel anxious you feel helpless. And your body also responds in the same way. So you have the same bodily sensations every time this shadow character shows up. Okay, so here's the work, right? You recognize that a shadow character is around. You, re you begin to recognize the cries of the inner child and you do your centering practice so that you can witness your internal experience and make some notes of it. And that way you get some space from it. You take it outside of yourself, right? Onto the paper and you make some space from it. So you give this shadow character an image. What does he or she look like in this moment? And you give it a name. the child, the orphan, the abandoned one, the victim, the bad boy. And you recognize, and this is the spiritual work, you recognize this is not who I am. I am spirit, or whatever your name is for that, right? 
I am the essence of God or of the divine. This is a shadow character that's arising in me right now. So if you're psychological and you want to, you can trace the roots back and figure out where this came from. And you can recognize that he or she is taking you back to the past, right? And if you respond, let's say, to your partner out of this very young part, let's say this very young part is very needy or blaming because he or she feels abandoned, then what are the consequences for your relationship of responding from that part? And so knowing this, you can come back to your adult self and make a different choice and break that pattern does that make sense? I know it's complicated and it's a lot of material. Okay. So how does this work in relationships? When each person brings a full choir of shadow characters into the mix. Have you, have you ever thought about that? Those of you who are in a relationship? How many people are actually in the relationship? <laughs> I know my grandmother's been in my marriage. <laughs> I mean, really. And then our inner parts, how many parts of us are activated in our relationship? So let's carry the inner child into couple dynamics for a minute. <clears throat> So when we become adults and we become intimate with and attached to someone, we're usually unaware that the inner child still lives in the darkness inside of us, in the closet of our mind. But he or she can be triggered at the slightest hint of abandonment or criticism by a partner. And then mistrust escalates into full-blown rage or tears, and we're devastated. Why? Because our partners are not the nurturing, available, all-loving parents that we never had. Right? A lot of you know this. So by examining our relationships in the context of the shadow's hidden needs, we move from shadow boxing to shadow dancing. We pierce the veil of projection and we see our partner with clear perception. And then we discover that our beloved is both the solution and the problem. <laughs> the answer and the question to be asked again and again. So I'm going to give you an example of this from my practice. Let's see. Okay. So a couple in my therapy practice discovered just what we're talking about now. Joel, a 46-year-old screenwriter, was divorced by his first wife after 12 years. And he was accustomed to intimacy and emotional support. And so he was really surprised at the strength of his attraction to Ellen who was a stockbroker and who thrived in her autonomy. And during their first six months of dating, he pulled her in and she pushed him away. As they became more involved, Joel didn't want to face his separateness or develop his independence. He tried to feel safe through fusion, through losing himself in Ellen. <clears throat> So what were his thoughts? Remember now we're doing shadow work. So inside of his mind, he's saying to himself, I'm scared, she's abandoning me. His feelings were frightened and anxious. His sensations were tight solar plexus, throat closed. His image was of a boy in fetal position and he named this the abandoned boy. 
Okay? You following so far? In response to his needy pursuit, Ellen clung to her separateness for safety, judging his dependency needs as unacceptable. Whereas his inner child feared abandonment most of all, her inner child feared being emotionally overwhelmed by his neediness. So what were her thoughts? I'm suffocating. He's too demanding for me. What were her feelings? Overwhelmed and repelled. What were her sensations? Tight shoulders, tight belly. What was the image? A little girl running away from a needy father. Her name, escape artist. So as a result of this dynamic, right, in which their shadow characters were trying to find a safe place to dance, but constantly triggering each other into anxiety and craziness, right? So as a result, he felt that he could never get enough love from Ellen, and she felt smothered until a destructive part of her lashed out at him and hurt their intimacy in an effort to restore her sense of safety. So with shadow work, they discovered um, which characters were at work in them. They, they called it the fuser and the distancer. And as he learned to tie himself to the mast in meditation and find a sense of security inside himself, he no longer panicked when he felt alone. And he even grew to enjoy solitude, which was a major step for him. And she allowed herself to feel loved and she began to feel more dependent on him and even to need him. And she was afraid of these feelings and she felt humiliated by them. But with time, she learned to witness her abrupt rejection of the closeness. And they continued to bring more of themselves into conscious awareness and into their relationship. So the quest for ideal relationship has taken on mythic proportions in our day. And it, you know, it grips us with hope and devastation from romantic novels and celebrity headlines and movie plots. And we understand the mystery of love and, and what makes it work. <laughs> but to be in a conscious, committed relationship is really complex. It means becoming aware of all these shadow characters that we bring into our intimacy. And it means becoming aware of how we project them onto our partners and reclaiming these projections so that love is free to be given and received between two adults. If we make a commitment to another person before we've uncovered our own shadows, and accepted our partner's shadow characters, then we might perform a persona marriage and kind of vowing to hold up each other's masks. Um, if we marry in the grip of a, a romantic projection, then the shadow may act out at any time. A conscious relationship isn't like that. It's about the partners vowing to accept and honor the full entourage of the partner's inner world. And vowing to wake up to shadow awareness when they're triggered. Promising to stop blaming the other person for your own stuff reclaiming your projections and being accountable as an adult, 
and being as authentic as you can be with your partner. So this is shadow dancing. Um, and this is what I, what I would say is that a marriage in this way can become a journey of souls toward the great reunion with spirit. And our partner can be our best mirror for our evolution, for the evolution of our consciousness. Thank you. Um, I'm just recently new to the whole concept of the shadow and actually just recently attended, oh sure, an intensive retreat last weekend doing my own shadow work. So my mind has just been opened. So thank you for the work that you do. Um, my question pertains to um, trauma, in particular sexual trauma, mm -hmm. and how it impacts the formation of your shadow and how to um, approach that um, and heal from trauma um, that occurred, at a, a sexual trauma that occurred at a very young age and that has basically, um, you know, been running the show the whole time mm -hmm. um, of your life. So... Yeah, that's, that's my question. Well, that's a pretty big question. I know. <laughs> and I know. We're not, we can't do therapy here. So, um, and I don't do it anymore. So, um, you know, childhood violation is particularly difficult, I think. Um, because trauma gets locked in the body and in the cells, you know? And so I think for some people, it's really important to do trauma work that engages the body and not um, risk leaving it intellectual. Because insight cannot, insight cannot resolve that. Yes. Insight cannot resolve that. However, you know, childhood abuse has probably set more people on the path than anything else. Because our longing for healing goes with our longing for consciousness. And so, you know, even though it's horrific, there is that gift in it, that it brings us to guides and healers and mentors, and it brings us to self-knowledge, and it brings us to face the darkness in people who were important and crucial to us. Um, in a way, this is kind of a controversial thing to say, but in a way it's an initiation. It initiates us out of innocence into the darkness in humanity. You know, there are people who've had sort of, nobody has a perfect childhood, but I think people who have overprotected, over-idealized childhoods tend to not have a lot of depth. It's a big generalization, but it, you know, so our trauma, our, our boundary violations, our betrayals initiate us into human darkness. I'm not saying that's a good thing, but it's what is. It's what happens. And, um, and for many people, it sets them on the journey. Like you, like you, <clears throat> um, I'm a retired therapist. Ah. Uh, and my orientation was much more toward Jung. Um, but Sigmund Freud had some real positive uh, additions 
to the field of psychology. And one of them was called the repetition compulsion. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where a lot of childhood traumas, especially sexual traumas, mm -hmm. uh, comes about. And we keep replaying these traumas over and over and over again mm -hmm. until we can finally uh, resolve them. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think that <clears throat> society, as you pointed out, uh, including our parents, churches, education, etc., uh, creates a lot of the shadow, but also tends to guide uh, a lot of how our shadow gets manifested as addictions. Mm -hmm. um, when, I, when I was in college, everybody smoked. Right. Everybody was addicted to playing bridge. Right. Okay. Uh, today, I would say in our society, we have three addictions. Uh, the first is materialism. Second is sex. And th the third is alcohol. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think society has uh, a lot to do with what our addictions look like. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the family, the individual family doesn't create shadow material um, independent of context. It's, you know, the individual is in the family and the family is in a subculture and the subculture is in the larger culture. And that was one of Jung's contributions as he separated from Freud was about collective shadow and collective unconscious. So I think I agree with what you're saying. I do think that repetition compulsions have, and that means that we repeat these self-destructive patterns no matter, we can't stop ourselves from constantly repeating these patterns. Um, that there are meaningful, purposeful th reasons for these patterns. And that's what shadow work can help you to uncover. Yeah, and so, you know, why do you always pick the same guy who does the same thing? I mean, how many women have I heard say that, right? Their shadows are leading them to choose this person for particular reasons. And, um, and you know, we could kind of reduce it and say to, to learn something or to heal something. It, it's more complex than that, but, but it's purposeful. So, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, you mentioned human darkness uh, a couple of minutes ago. And what you say makes sense uh, about the shadow. But there also seems to be another level of what seems just um, evil, mm -hmm. cruelty, mm -hmm. that goes, it seems to go beyond the shadow in that kind of personal yeah. sense. Yeah. Could you say a little bit how the, that is related to what you've been talking about? That sort of, shall we say, almost uh, cosmic evil that uh, sometimes seems to be afoot in the world? Am I qualified to speak about this? You know, I, I think before you came in, I mentioned that I, I'm not talking about sociopathy or... Uh, serious psychopathology, serious craziness. I'm trying to kind of give us a way to process ordinary kind of everyday self-destructiveness because that there is a way to do that. And, you know, my method, this is really spelled out in Romancing the Shadow. If this is hitting any of you, you know, at the Bone, that's the book I would recommend. Um, for this larger question, um, there seems to be, you know, something in the collective right now that's, that really is, it, it looked for a while, like a few decades ago, 
one issue after another was coming out of the collective shadow. You know, childhood sexual abuse came out of the shadow. Um, homophobia came out of the collective shadow. Um, there was like a whole kind of series of things. And now it seems like a free for all. So I don't, you know, there's, there's, people are acting out on such gross levels. Um, and the political arena has, you know, kind of given permission for some of the worst of human nature to be expressed. And I don't know where that's taking us in terms of, you know, I want to bring it back to sort of human development and the evolution of consciousness, because that's why we're here. I don't know where it's bringing us in that context. Um, I have moments, and I kind of shock myself, where I wish certain things would get stuffed back into the dark, into the cloud. <laughs> the shadow queen wants to stick it back into the darkness. But, you know, it's pretty intolerable. It's pretty intolerable right now. I think no matter what our politics, just the sensibility of it, just the civility, the lack of civility, it's pretty awful. So I don't know uh, why that's happening or what will come of it. Um, it feels dangerous to me right now. Thanks. Uh, one of the questions I have about this is the aging process, the role of dementia. Where does dementia come into play? Because I will share one little shadow that came out. You know, I found myself, oh, maybe being a little more curt or rude, you know, and it was like a lack of inhibition. And, you know, I, I'm just very, very fascinated with this whole idea of aging gracefully, that I really feel that, you know, by, by this consciousness that you're speaking about, it, it can be done. So my question is, when people are getting older and inhibitory responses are getting uh, a little less control, the frontal lobe, or in the presence of full-blown disease process of dementia. How would you work with somebody who, who is experiencing these times, you know, maybe forgetting to hold the door for somebody, or, you know, you, you see this happen a lot in the aging. I was a nurse. I was a psychiatric nurse. So, um, you know, you, you see the lack of inhibition. And is it the shadows coming out, or is this a physical manifestation, or is it both? Hmm. Um, another easy one. <laughs> what an easy crowd. Um, <clears throat> you know, I went through this with my dad. Took care of my dad with Alzheimer's. And there was a release of inhibition around talk of sexuality. And his friends called me and complained about it because they, they felt like they couldn't be out in public with him. My experience of him was that, and, and he was a genius intellect, but my experience of him when he lost his mind is he fell into his heart. And his emotional life, his um, connection to his feelings just blossomed. So that's a different frame for what had been stuffed coming forward. I mean, we would go to the movies, he would cry. I had never seen this in my whole life. So there was a lot of stuff going on and it was complex and um, some of it could be deemed inappropriate, and some of it was really precious. So I don't know. Um, my next book is about aging and meeting the shadow of age. And there are a lot of shadow issues that come up in late life, all different, you know, all different kinds. 
of issues. And I think that this epidemic of dementia, I'm writing about this epidemic of dementia that's happening because the very people, the elders who are supposed to be the holders of memory and tradition and family and everything are losing their memories. And Google has become the collective memory. So that thing is really changing now and we don't know why that is. Um, there's a, if any of you are interested in this, there's a book called The End of Alzheimer's that I recommend. It's a bit technical about the brain, but it's a fantastic, brilliant book. Um, so again, complicated question. Hope I <laughs> responded okay. <laughs>